please turn with me in your Bibles. I want to take you to the seventh and final message of our series, which we called the four seasons of life. And we've mostly been in Ezekiel chapter one, but I want you to go here this morning to Ecclesiastes chapter three, Ecclesiastes chapter three. And we are going to read our text. Just find Proverbs and the next book is Ecclesiastes, written by King Solomon. We are going to turn to it. But our entire series has been the four, se the four seasons of life. That's the series title. Now I want to give a message as we close on this seventh and last message. And I'm calling it by the same title, the four seasons of life. As we looked at the previous six messages, we stayed in Ezekiel 1 with the four cherubim. And we looked at all the attributes of them as symbols or as a real lesson to us about the redeemed believer, what we're to be. But I want to go a stage further here this morning. Reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. And our message of four seasons of life. To everything there is a season and a time. To every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born. And a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather together stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. And then lastly, verse 11, he that is God, hath made everything beautiful in his time. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for your, your presence, your hand upon us, how you walk with us and you fellowship with us. You're the divine gardener. You're the planter. You're the farmer. You're the good shepherd. You're all things unto us. And I pray this morning in this message, will you be all things unto us? Will you make us to discern the season and the hour and the time that we're living in both individually as an entire church as well? Nor God, open our eyes, teach us, instruct us, make us conscious and aware of the season that we're passing through. And Lord God, we thank you that our lives are not haphazard. They're not accidental. Lord God, even the winter time is ordained of you like the summertime. Oh God, things are not out of your hand. When we cry, it's not out of your control. Nor God, any more than when we laugh. Nor God, when it's darkness all around us, it's no less your presence there than when it is light and bright. And we thank you for all these things that you will Weave them together, the good things with the bad things, the winter with the summer, nor God to bring forth fruitfulness and harvest and life and abundance and blessing out of our lives, nor God we can as much serve you in autumn as we can winter and springtime and summer. And nor God, I pray that you give us such an overwhelming sense that no matter what season of life, whether it's childhood or early age or adulthood, our elderly age, whatever the season of our life, that we would revel in it, nor God, that we would not merely look to another season with sadness, but oh God, we would enter in fully to your plan today, your plan and your purpose for us. And Lord God, we ask above all else, be glorified in us and through us by bearing much fruit. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. And so our message is the four seasons of life. And we're going to look at these four seasons. We're going to look at summer and autumn. We're going to look at winter and springtime. Because these four seasons have a spiritual application to your life. What they are in nature, they are used in the Bible to speak to us about our walk with God and our spiritual life. We have so far spent six messages in Ezekiel chapter 1. Let me just give you a summary of Ezekiel as we go into this finishing different message. Because we're not going to deal much at all with Ezekiel 1 or with Ezekiel. But I want to introduce it with a few words of Ezekiel to give you a context. Ezekiel the prophet was carried into captivity in Babylon from the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was his home. Israel was his people. And yet he was a godly man. In the future, alone not in Jerusalem, he wasn't a prophet in Jerusalem. He was of the Levitical line. He would have been a priest if he would have stayed in Jerusalem, if there wouldn't have been an invasion, a captivity, if Nebuchadnezzar's army had not carried away Israel. Do you know he would have grown up in Jerusalem, part of the priesthood, ministering in the temple, but he gets carried away. There is a season in his life where although he's righteous and he's godly and he's upright and he walks with God and he loves the word of God, yet he gets carried off into captivity. He'll never serve in the temple. You began that at the age of 30. He won't spend his days in Jerusalem. In fact, his ears hear that the temple gets burnt down and utterly destroyed and annihilated. There is no more temple. There is no more priesthood. There's no more ministry. Jerusalem is devastated. And this young man carried away into captivity begins to hear report after report after report. How discouraging to hear of Zion, the Jerusalem of God, that was the glory of all the earth. That Jerusalem, the apple of God's eye, was desolate. And here you have this young man carried into captivity. And in captivity, God comes to him and calls him or makes him a prophet. So he's not going to serve as a priest in Jerusalem. He's going to serve as a prophet in the land of captivity. What a prophet that we have dealt with in these messages For six messages, we mainly dealt with Ezekiel chapter 1. And what a chapter, what a chapter Ezekiel 1 was. That vision that as soon as he's called to be a prophet in the land of captivity, he is immediately caught up in this amazing, remarkable vision. God is going to speak to him amazingly all through this book, chapter after chapter. Vision after vision, prophecy after prophecy. But it all begins in Ezekiel 1 when God gives him a vision of the four cherubim that come out of the fire. And we have dealt with what they represent and the message. But look at this Ezekiel in his remarkable prophecy and letter. A bit later in his prophecy in Ezekiel 36 to 39, it predicts a war. And remember, this 2,600 years ago that he prophesies or writes this prophecy. 2,600 years ago, 600 years before Christ, he is giving this. What does he deal with in Ezekiel 36 and 39? About a time when Israel, the Jews, would be scattered into all nations of the earth. It wasn't in his day. They were in Babylon, in captivity, not in all the nations of the world. And yet this man looks down through the corridors of time. See, he's got eagle's eyes. He looks down. He can see afar off. He can see 2,600 years into the future. And he begins to predict that Israel is going to get gathered from all nations of the earth, especially from the north or from Russia. 
and they're going to be regathered to their little nation. And God is going to begin step by step restoring them, rebuilding them, and finally spiritually reviving them. Do you know, he talks about a war that has never yet happened. This Ezekiel, the prophet, he's in Babylon. He'll never serve in that temple. He'll never see Jerusalem again. And yet he can look afar off. And he can see an invasion of Israel where Russia, Turkey and Iran and other nations join together to invade Israel and they fall as an entire army, five out of six soldiers on the mountains of Israel, which is that area contested over today and called Palestine that they say belongs to the Palestinians. You know what? An entire army is going to get annihilated on those very mountains. This is 2,600 years ago. Remember what we dealt with just two weeks ago about the eagle face of the cherubim. Remember how I said John was like that. He was on Patmos, yet he ascended on high. This old man of God in prison, a captive of the emperor, persecuted, his life threatened. And yet on the island of Patmos, he took wings and he ascended into the heavenlies and he saw things afar off that are yet to come to pass in our day and generation. So I think Ezekiel is very like Jeremiah. I believe Ezekiel had eagle's eyes. I believe he had the ability to mount up with wings of an eagle and see like an eagle, like we dealt with last time. And he, Ezekiel states 72 times in his book, this statement, when he's given his prophecies, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Why did God give him all these prophecies? That they may know that I am the Lord. As we go into this last message, why am I saying all that? Because I want you to understand, Ezekiel was shown the four cherubim in Ezekiel 1. Then he sees all of this over the next years. I believe we can see from Ezekiel's life, there are different seasons in his life. Do you realize when he mounted up with wings of an eagle and gained that eagle vision that could see 2,600 years into the future to our day, to the days just before us? Do you realize he was in a winter season? He got carried off into Babylon. He had hard things to face. His eyes wept many tears. As you read this book about this man of God, you read in Ezekiel 24, 16, the Lord comes to him and gives him a personal prophecy. You know, in the church today, there's a lot of personal prophecies, but you never get personal prophecies like this. It's all the Lord wants to bless you. The Lord's given you gifts. The Lord uh, wants to do remarkable things through you that he's never done through anyone else. What sort of a word did God give Ezekiel? Listen to this in chapter 24, 16. Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes, that is his wife, with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. Do you realize God had ordained certain seasons in Ezekiel's life? The season of captivity. You're not going to go into ministry like you thought. You're going to get carried away from your city. Guess what? God's will was in it. Do you think this was the devil? Do you think the devil allowed him to be carried off into captivity? Absolutely not. God had a plan. Do you not think he cried many tears? Yes, he did. Do you know here he's told, God actually says, guess what? I'm going to take your wife away. The desire of your eyes who you love, and I don't want you to cry any tears. He, told, he actually told Ezekiel when his wife is going to get taken. And he says, I want you to put your best clothes on. I want you to dress smartly, have your best suit on, your good Sunday hat. And I want you to go to church and preach. That's what I want you to do. And you're not allowed to mourn. You're not allowed to wear black. Make sure it's that red tie that you're wearing on this morning. 
Make sure you wear that blue, nice sky blue jacket. I'm, I'm just using a bit of preacher's license here. You go and read the text for yourself and you'll see this, that God is actually saying, yes, I brought you into an hour of sorrow. Do you not think my plan's in this? Do you know why? That God would allow Ezekiel to pass through a season like that. Because you know what? In Israel, God's bride had died and nobody cares about it. All the people in ministry, no one's weeping over God's bride. Nobody's mourning and rending their hearts and wearing black. None of them are sitting silent, dumbstruck over the condition of the church in their hour and day. And I want to tell you, it's the same in our day. We have a generation who are not grieving over the condition of the church. You know what God was doing? Ezekiel, you're going to feel what I feel so that when you preach, you're going to know my heartbeat. You are going to become the message. You're not merely going to prophesy. You're not merely going to preach. You are going to embody and feel and know and understand my heart for my bride. What you feel for her... You, you're going to see, I feel for my people, Israel. And so you see that in a man, Ezekiel, who's given us this, where we have got all our messages from Ezekiel 1, the four cherubim representing the four seasons of life in the life of Ezekiel, I see certain different seasons in his life ordained of God. The very worst of the seasons in his life are ordained and planned for God, of God, and they're still affecting you and I in this room. Don't tell me the things you don't understand. Tragedy, heartache, weeping, things you cannot understand are not allowed of God for a divine purpose. You may never understand. I, I wonder if Ezekiel could ever understand how much he would affect our world through his prophecies. Let me go to my message here, the four seasons of life. It says in Genesis chapter 8, 22, while the earth remaineth, it's a promise. While the earth remaineth, it's not going to always remain. There's a day God's going to roll it all up. The earth is going to be burnt with fire. So it's not always going to remain. It comes to an end and God will create a new earth, which the righteous will dwell upon. But he says, while the earth remaineth, notice what continues always. This 6,000 years ago, seed time and harvest. All the big companies in America are never going to break this. Seed time and harvest is ordained of God to the end of time. Cold and heat, summer and winter. Yes, they're playing with our weather. There's no doubt about that. They're playing with everything in society. But there'll always be a summer. There'll always be a winter. And he says, and day and night shall not cease. And so he gives all of this. Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. None of these things. God has ordained them right at the beginning of time. And for 6,000 years, they have remained. Remember what we said in Genesis chapter 1 and 14 on day 4 of creation. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs. Th these two lights for day and night are for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. In other words, the sun and the moon affect the four seasons right across our world. Do you know the sun and the moon affects everything? It affects our day. Do you realize night and day is affected by these two great lights? And by their functioning, God created them, our days our year, everything set. This is in Genesis, right at the back, beginning of everything. And God is saying, I have established these great bodies in the sky, in the universe, 
And you know what? They're going to affect. You're always going to have a day. You're always going to have a season. You're always going to have night and day. All of these things are established of God in a real way. It says in Psalm 104, 19, he, that is God, appointed the moon for seasons. So do you see God very clearly in the Bible says he is behind this and he sets the moon in place to affect the seasons of the world. The moon affects the tidal motions of Ireland and of all nations. The moon has been created and it has that power. But who's the power behind the moon? It is God himself. He has appointed the moon for seasons to control these things. The sun knoweth his going down. In other words, the sun knows when to go down. God has ordained. Do you realize it happens every 24 hours? Do you realize how regular this is? Can you imagine one of these days if the sun didn't go down or if it didn't rise in the morning? Can you imagine the panic in Ireland? The chaos, the questions, <coughs> the uproar. And yet God says, hold on. The sun knows when to go down. Why? Because I told it. I tell it. I set it in order. Don't you realize the moon and the sun is in the hands of God? Those two greatest of bodies that affect our world. And those two bodies actually affect the seasons. It brings certain seasons on. You can't hold them back any more than you can stop the sun and the moon and hold them in your hands. If you could hold them in your hands, then maybe I would think you had some power, but you've got no power over these things. It says in Psalm 31, 15, and this is the psalmist, David, speaking. He's in a dark time, a hard season of life. There's troubles. Men are seeking to kill him. Listen to what he says. My times are in thy hand. Do you really believe that this morning? That your times are in his hands? Or do you think it's in the devil's hands? Other people's hands? The hands of fate, circumstance, perchance. There's no order in it. There's no reason. There's no purpose. My life just goes from one thing to another thing, but there's no actual purpose in anything that happens around me. David actually in a very dark hour says, my times are in thy hand. Then he says, deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. What a remarkable thing that David knew his times, his seasons, his nights and days, no one else had power over them. His faith was in God. He loved God. He followed God. He obeyed God. And so his times are your times in God's hands. Do you believe that? Have you put your times in God's hands? Or do you have more faith that your, ha your times are in the hands of circumstance and other people? The changing seasons of nature have also been ordained of God. And we can see that the four seasons in the Bible, and you're going to see this in a moment, the four seasons in the Bible can be applied spiritually in your life or the life of this local church or to Bible prophecy. When you begin to study this, you'll see there are seasons of Bible prophecy, distinct biblical seasons, the beginning and the end when certain things are going to happen. And God has ordained those seasons. Jesus said, can you discern the season, the prophetic season that you're living in? And so we see that prophetic world history is divided into certain seasons, all different, all distinct with different things happening at that time. We're not about to see the birth of the Messiah. That was 2,000 years ago. It happened already. It's not going to happen the second time. We are living in the hour just prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That didn't happen 2,000 years ago or 500 years ago. It is ordained for this time and this season. There are prophetic seasons 
in God's calendar. And so the four seasons can be applied to that prophetically. I also believe the four seasons can be applied to the worldwide church, the real body of Christ over the past 2000 years. I, I believe in reading and studying church history most of my lifetime. And I love church history. I love to read about it. I can see certain distinct seasons. I can see winter times in church history where everything was barren and dead. And I see other times, spring times, that came to the church of revival and restoration and summer times of great and gatherings of harvest. I see all of this in church history. But I want you to see here that the four seasons are also applied to the individual Christian life. And I want you to understand this. Lest someone or some smart aleck after wants to tell me in certain countries there's only two seasons. And sometimes in Ireland you think you only get perpetual rain from year to year, from January to December. Some people will argue that. Or when I went to Iceland once, I arrived and the sun, as I arrived into the airport, the sun is a ball sitting on the horizon. It never went any lower. During the summer in Iceland, the sun never goes down. But then go back there during the winter, the sun never rises. So we understand in our world, there are some places that seem to lack the full clarity of four seasons. We understand that. And even the full clarity of night and day, we understand that. But that does not deny what we're saying here, that there's four distinct seasons and the Bible talks about them in a very real way. You see, all winters are not the same in Ireland. Winter comes every year, but all winters are not the same. Sometimes we have a very mild winter, but yet we know it's winter time. There's other times where, like when I was younger, and any farmer, you ask farmers in Ireland, they don't believe in all this climate change rubbish. They don't believe in that. And any farmer worth his salt knows, and this is what they said, the old farmers, they just go, but it always goes in a cycle like this. Sometimes you have years of very hard winters, and then you have years, decades of very mild winters. For, real farmers aren't bluffed by that. And there's some political farmers in Ireland still, when they open their mouth, boy, they, they, they chase the whole thing out of court. They know what they're talking about. So all winters are not the same. All summers are not the same in length or intensity or in severity or in difficulty. Whatever the season, it can vary. <clears throat> and even in our world, while some countries are in winter, others are in summer. You know, I contact my mother-in-law and she's there going, I can hardly breathe. I'm sweltering. I wish there was a cool breeze. I'm sitting here in Ireland saying, I'm freezing, it's cold. I've got three layers on, if you're around over the past week. I've got three layers on, the fire is going. I've got gloves on, and I'll wear about two or three hats just to go outside to walk Shiloh. And, and so you've got different seasons, even in different parts of the world. But it does not change this factor. It says in Psalm 74 and 17, Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. God has set these in place. It says in Proverbs 26 and 1, As snow is in summer, snow in summer, that's out of place. So it says, as snow is in summer, and rain in harvest, in Israel, in harvest time, it doesn't rain. It never rains in harvest time in Israel. And so he's saying, snow in summertime is out of place. So is rain in harvest time. It's out of place. And then listen to what he says. So honor is not seemly for a fool. 
See, someone who's a fool, and some people online, they don't like me calling people fools. I don't call people personally fools. But if the stone hits you and you yell, don't blame me, okay? Don't do that. Or if you know someone who fits the bill, don't say I called them a fool. I'm giving you scripture. So it says someone who's classified as a fool, don't honor them. Someone who acts foolish, thinks foolish, speaks foolish, for you to put honor on them and give them respect and admire them is just as out of place as having snow in the summertime. It doesn't fit. There's something wrong with it. And so God has ordained seasons. Certain things happen in certain seasons. And if it doesn't, then it's just not right. A season contains certain things. You know, in winter, you're not meant to be getting sunburned. That would be out of place. In summertime, you shouldn't be making snowballs. That is out of place. So when these four spiritual seasons come to your life, don't think you'll always be laughing in wintertime. You will not. Don't ask yourself when everything is barren and dark and cold, why do I feel down? Don't be surprised at that. You see, there is a divine purpose for the seasons. There is a specific time an occasion for the seasons. The wrong season at the wrong time is wrong. You need the right season at the right time in the right order to accomplish the right thing. There's a unique way to walk through each season of life. And we saw this with the four cherubim. No matter what the season of life is, you are to go through as a calf, as an ox, as a lamb, as an eagle. You can be all four of those no matter the season of life, no matter what it is like in around you. There is a specific purpose for each of the seasons. Listen again what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1. To everything there is a season. In other words, every individual thing, there's a right season for it to happen. And a time to every purpose under heaven. You know, he gives then a list in these first eight verses, a time to be born, a time to die. They're all opposites. A time to be happy, a time to cry. They're all opposites. Life and death, birth and death are opposites. They seem to contradict. There's a time to gather stones and to cast stones away. They seem to contradict. And yet God says, hold on, there's an actual right season. You and your mind think they contradict, they don't fit. Yes, they do. If they come at the right season, at the right time, in the right way, even death will bring forth fruit in your life. To have death at the wrong time won't. To have a burthen of life at the wrong time, it won't either. But look how God weaves all this together. He has certain things to happen in certain seasons. And certain seasons aren't meant to be sun scorched. If you keep thinking, why isn't the sun shining on me? Maybe it's not meant to shine on you. Why am I walking through darkness? Because that is part of this season in your life. Why isn't God speaking to me? He spoke to me before about this and this and this and this. And he seems so silent during this time. Maybe he's deliberately being silent. Some people want to hear God for everything, on every issue, all the time. I've met lots of people in the church. They claim that they hear God very clearly on everything, all the time. I very nicely want to say they're liars at best. The apostle Paul wasn't like that. Jeremiah wasn't like that. David wasn't like that. Moses wasn't like that. Nobody has heard God's voice constantly all the time. You know what? That would destroy you. That would be dangerous to you. Not even the apostle Paul lived in that condition. Sometimes he just done what seemed right and going, that's not the will of God, and that's not the will of God, but I know what's written. I obey you, I serve you. But he was seeking to find the will of God. He didn't hear voices all the time, but he knew to do the will of God. You've got to be very careful about these things. What is a season? It's a change of climate. 
It's an atmosphere, a certain set atmosphere around you, a certain temperature. You may not be able to say when winter starts, but you certainly know when it arrives. You may not be able to give a date or a time, but you go, winter's here. How do you know? The temperature has changed. Do you realize with the change in seasons, storms can be created or held back? In America, there's hurricane season. I'm glad I don't live in some of those places. I'm glad I don't live in South Africa when I see the snakes and the monkeys that get into your kitchen, squeezing through the bars. My mother-in-law had an incident this past week where they squeeze in. And believe me, you don't want to face a South African monkey in your kitchen. You don't want to do that. So I'm very glad for what we have in Ireland. But you know what? Our entire climate creates an atmosphere. And so with a certain season and the movements of the moon and the uh, the sun, there's changing weather induced and marked by a particular weather pattern. And listen, as a result of the earth, earth's changing pattern around the sun. Do you hear what I've said? As the earth moves, you know the earth is constantly moving. Every 24 hours, it moves in such a way that you're seeing the sun, then you don't see the sun. Every 24 hours, every day is like that because it's turning in such a way. You have night and day, night and day, night and day. You're experiencing that. And the entire globe is literally moving like that. And then also you have in a period of a year, the earth is so moving that it revolves around the entire sun in one year. In an entire year, that year is set where it moves in that sort of pattern. So the days are set and the years are set. They're set in orbit. They're set in distinct ways. And do you know, it is the influence of the sun on the earth that ordains or sets the seasons in place. So you've got all of this happening in a remarkable way. You see, I believe when you begin to look at the four natural physical seasons around you, you know what you begin to see? You begin to see God's sovereignty, his absolute control. You begin to see his power that he ordained these things 6,000 years ago and he's still in control. He cannot lie. His word cannot be broken. You also see the timetable of God. If God has set the day in place and he set the year in place and it follows an order, do you think your life is that out of order? I know it may seem like that, but that's because you need to begin to understand the word of God. You need to understand the plan of God. Do you know the four seasons are used to mold and to shape the environment around them? They affect the plant life. They affect the economy. They affect the oceans. They affect the weather. The four seasons do that. So the four seasons have been ordained of God to mold, to affect, to create a very specific atmosphere at a certain time. This is all remarkable that I'm telling you here. It says in Zechariah 14, speaking prophesying of the time of the millennium, it says that the hill of the Lord's going to be exalted. Then a river flows out. And this continues to flow in summer and winter. A river flows out into the Dead Sea and into the Mediterranean. And this goes on every year summer and winter for a thousand years. It's going to keep on flowing throughout that entire time. Let me bring you here to the four seasons. And I'm not going to cover everything about these seasons. I just want you to see there are four seasons applied to the spiritual life. I hope you're already beginning to see that and understand that. If you see God's sovereignty in the seasons of our natural world, if you see his unchangeable nature, his plan, his order, his control. Can you not transpose that onto your personal individual life? If you trust him and love him and walk with him, 
Are you honestly going to allow thoughts to cram in and to steal your peace by saying everything is out of order? Why? Because it's cold? Why? Because you're suffering loss? Why? Because someone died? Why? Because your heart's broken? Surely it's out of order because I'm crying tears. Don't you know there's a season for crying? What do you think God only ordains seasons where you laugh and you dance? and you rejoice, and you gather, and you're born. You see, we choose all those things, but hold on. There's a corresponding thing here that seems contradictory, but it has its right season. It's vital. It's ordained. It's important. It produces something. And so all these work together. Let me give you the four seasons here very briefly with a summary of what they represent for our lives. Number one, springtime. The Bible does explain and lay out to us a springtime. I thought I'd start with something good here. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 11, this is what it says. For lo, the winter is past. It's saying here, winter has just come to its end. There's a time when you become aware winter is ended. Have you had a winter season in your life? Do you realize when winter ends, you can know it? I've walked through winter. I've been there for months. I know it's climate. It's dark. It's cold. It's not always nice. But here in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and 11, it says, For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. Winter has actually come to an end. It's not speaking about the physical season here in the Song of Solomon. It's talking about a spiritual something going on amongst God's people. The flowers appear on earth. What is this? It's springtime. What comes after winter when everything begins to spring? It's springtime. It's well named. The time of the singing of birds has come. Do you remember what it's like at the end of winter? When you're coming out of winter and spring comes in and suddenly you start waking in the morning. Oh, it's lighter in the morning. And the, all the birds are chirping, singing, beautiful birds. They've come from all manners of other countries and they stop off in Ireland on their way to their final destination. And you're there going, isn't this beautiful? Well, that's what the Song of Solomon is talking about. And the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The turtle or the dove often represents the work of the Holy Spirit coming. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. I believe the first season we see here is springtime. God ordains for his church. God ordains in the individual life. There's a time when winter periods in your life come to an end. Maybe you're in a winter period. Maybe it's been long and dark and hard. Maybe it feels monotonous, like it's never going to come to an end. The chill, the freezing, the coldness. How you have to deal with that. Will it ever come to an end? Yes, God ordains seasons. He knows what's too much for you, you know. He knows what would break you. Winter is necessary, but it can't stay winter. It mustn't stay winter. And so there's a springtime when he says, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. It's a time of a new beginning. It's a time of reviving. It's a time of springing forth. It's a time of restoration where everything that's been lost during autumn and winter, it is now restored. Have you ever seen in a garden where there's all the beautiful flowers and at the end of summer, you see them die and wilt and fade away and disappear and you're so sad about it. And then springtime, you begin to see from this barren, desolate garden, you can suddenly see it spring into life. It was all there. All the life was there, but it's come through other dark seasons. You're not meant to have all the flowers blooming during winter. Certain flowers do, and they're ordained that way. But on the whole, most of my garden flowers, I want to tell you, in my hands, they usually die anyway because of my ill treatment. 
you know, I, I thought I was doing good all my flowers. I went, I'm going to keep all these flowers. Candace has left me. So I was watering them constantly. I'm wondering why they're beginning to wither. Then I had, say, I, I, I'm, I apologize. I'm not a farmer and I'm not a gardener. And they're saying, no, 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 you're watering them too much. That's why they're fading. You need to reduce that. I thought I was helping them. So don't leave your plants with me anytime soon. <laughs> you see, this is the time of renewal, of fresh starts, of new growth, growth, of a springing forth. God has ordained it. But listen to something very specific that's very interesting. Something has to happen at a very important and vital time, pruning. Do you know what you do in springtime? You prune. So springtime, it's a time where everything is beginning to grow. It's a new beginning. You need to be very careful. You're happy about springtime. Winter's over, springtime's here, everything is new. Oh, but I wanna tell you, springtime is always the time for the gardener to prune. You're now rejoicing on the change of season. You're looking forward to the future. If you neglect pruning or allowing God to prune you at springtime, do you know what it could mean in the months and the seasons ahead? A restriction on you spiritually. You could say, but look, there's life. The branches, aren't the branches good? They were last year, but they're not anymore. Springtime is the time to prune. Pruning, when do you prune? At the end of winter. It marks the beginning of spring. You wait to the very end of winter and the beginning of springtime. We've got one apple tree in our garden and two years, I don't know anything about gardening, so please, if you can correct me online or here, don't, don't come with a list of things. I'm a very ignorant man. So just be very gracious. If I get any of my facts wrong, I'm trying my best. I'm a Bible man. I'm a preacher, okay? This is my subject. I just try to understand these other things. <clears throat> but we've got an apple tree, and Candace used to tell me what to do, when to do it, and what to do it on. I just followed orders. I don't know enough. I trusted her. She said, two years ago, she said, see that apple tree? You, you need to prune it right back. I said, come show me. Show me, show me what to do. You show me the length. I'll do all the hard work, but you show me. So we went to the end of our garden and said, do this and cut that back, cut that branch right back. Just do all of this. I said, are you sure? She said, yes. I'm going, but won't we lose apples? No, you won't. You've got to do it now. Before all the new growth comes, you've got to cut back. See, I was scared. Oh, if we cut back right now, surely this is the wrong time. Surely not that much of the branch. Surely I like that branch. I've watched it grow for the past three years. It, it was good to be there. You didn't ask me to cut it last year. Surely that branch should stay there. No, not this year. And so we cut it back. Do you realize this summer, I could not gather the harvest of apples. They are the ginormous apples. I really mean it. I felt like framing one or two of them. I have never, Shiloh can't even lift them. They are large, these apples. Where did these apples come from? One small apple tree that was really pruned back at the beginning of springtime, before at the time of new growth. If I hadn't have done that, we wouldn't have apples like this. Do you know now, over the past couple of days, I've been going out because I'm changing a lot of things. So I'm thinking like a, a guy, okay, I'm in training, okay. But I'm trying to think like Candace. I'm a re I, I went to bed last night designing the cut of that apple tree. I was out about two weeks ago and I'm there looking at that. I'm going, you're going and you're going. I mean, there's a whole chunk of that. It's coming off. I, I'm literally now, it's winter time. We're not even halfway through winter and already I'm going, I know how I'm going to prune that apple tree back. You know why? Because I saw all the fruit. Oh, the fruit doesn't come in springtime. It doesn't. You don't prune to get something now. You're going to get it in harvest time, a different season. You're going to see here that what you need to do, you never get back in that season. What you put into a season is not what you get back in the same season. You're 
putting something in that, in that season, never seeing the return in that season, but it will come forth in a different season. Usually you get back in a season that you've never labored into on that particular thing. You've got to think ahead of time. Jesus said in John 15 too, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth. Notice I'm talking about pruning. The branches that have no fruit on them, you get rid of, you lop the entire branch off. But I'm not talking about lopping branches off. I'm talking about pruning. Pruning is not a removal. It is a cutting back. What do you prune? You prune branches that are producing fruit. You don't prune. Jesus does not prune individuals who are not bearing fruit. The only individuals in this church, Christ is going to prune back at the beginning of springtime are those who are already bearing spiritual fruit. If you're not bearing fruit, he'll just lop you off. Good for the fire, good for firewood. But see this branch, I'll cut him so far back, you won't even recognize that branch. But it's not because I hate it, it's because it has borne fruit and it will bear much more fruit, but I've got to prune it. Are you scared of God pruning your life or removing something from your life that you think you want to keep? You think it's precious and important. Yes, it was a year ago. Yes, it's been like important in your life for three years, but not this year. This is a new year. It's springtime. And that area of your life is bearing fruit, but we need to prune it back because something else has to come forth from it. Only Christ fully understands the principle involved here. You know as well what you do at this time and season is sowing. You're not going to reap. Could you imagine someone sowing things in springtime and then reaping the same things in the same season? That isn't how this works. Springtime, you begin sowing. You begin preparing. You don't say, I want to reap in two weeks' time or in one month's time. You don't have enough time. You've got to wait for a different season. What do you sow at the beginning of springtime? You'll reap in another season, not that season. Do you see how we think about things and we can get things very wrong? Why am I not seeing certain things happen in this season? Maybe you're just meant to reap. Maybe you're meant to sow at this time. Keep sowing, sowing, sowing. You, you say, well, I stopped sowing because I'm not seeing anything come back to me. No, it's a season to sow. You say, but I keep sowing, 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 sowing. Nothing's happening. Yeah, that's what you do at the sowing stage. Do you realize you multiply your sowing, but nothing's happening? Keep sowing because there's a reaping time, but it's not now. If you look for the reaping season, you're going to draw back, limit, restrict, and begin to get discouraged in that. You know, sowing and reaping is a spiritual truth brought into the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 9 and 11, Paul the Apostle speaking about his ministry to the church at Corinth, he says, I sow spiritual things into your life. Don't think it's strange then if I reap carnal things, natural things, physical benefits. He says, I am sowing spiritual ministry. So his preaching, his teaching, his prayers were spiritual sowing. Paul actually believed his ministry, teaching, and letters were his way to sow good seed into the church at Corinth. He knew he would reap. He knew good things would come out of that. Or what about 2 Corinthians 9 and 6? It says concerning you and your money, if you sow sparingly, you shall reap sparingly. How you give to God, not man, not ministries, not churches. How you give to God. What is your heart attitude? It's not the amount of money you give. God's not really interested. Remember the woman who brought a mite. She put in all that she had. Jesus is standing watching, watching men put big, large amounts in. It doesn't impress him. He's not really interested. 
And he actually teaches his disciples, said, that lady gave out of her lack. And he honored that. I, I assure you, she got something back. Do you know as well in Galatians chapter 6, and this is the most important thing concerning sowing and reaping. Listen to what it says. Galatians 6 verse 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, so shall he also reap. Speaking about your spiritual life. Then he goes on to explain. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So you see, springtime is a time not only of pruning, but of sowing, not reaping, but sowing. Can I ask you at this time in your spiritual life, what are you sowing into? Do you keep sowing to the flesh? You know what? I want to tell you, oh, it may not spring forth this month or this season. If you keep sowing to the flesh, you're going to reap a harvest from that, guaranteed. You can't keep listening to the flesh, serving the flesh, following the flesh, obeying the flesh, and not think, oh, it may not show today. It may not show tomorrow. We may not be aware. I guarantee you there's a season coming where all of that's going to show up. We are going to see what you were sowing into your life in this season. Because it's got to bear a harvest. It has to. But if you're so under the Spirit, oh, I may not see it. You may think, but nothing's happening. I'm praying. I'm fasting. I'm serving God. I'm obeying. I'm walking with God. But nothing's happening. Keep sowing. Keep sowing. You know why? You will reap a harvest. If you're so under the Spirit of God, if you're following Him, if you're listening to Him, if you're in the Word of God, do you realize even if nothing seems to happen now, but of course not. It's the sowing time. You don't, you don't sow today to the Spirit and reap tomorrow from the Spirit. Do you know if you're reaping from the Spirit today, it's because you sowed in a previous, situa- uh, a previous time. It's not that you just sowed this morning. You're not reaping today in this service what you sowed this morning to the Spirit. It's what you sowed to the Spirit over the past week, over the past year, over the past 10 years. And it's the same. So there's a springtime. That's our first thing. There's a springtime season ordained in your life. It's got a certain purpose, certain things you need to be aware of. You need to know what season it is. When you enter a springtime, you've got to know it's time to prune. It's time to sow. This is the time to do it. Don't leave pruning to summertime. Don't, don't do it in wintertime. Don't think about it in order, autumn time. Do it at the right season and time. My second point, summer. In Israel, summer was generally from May to October. It never rained, generally, or very infrequently during those months. Those months were hot, dry, stable, hot, predictable. You say you want summer perpetually. If you go to the Mediterranean, to Israel, and say, do you want summer all through the year, all the time? They'll say, no way. We're praying for autumn. We're praying for the autumn rain. Oh, yes, we look for summer to come, but then we look for summer to go. Summer is good, but not perpetual summer. In the Mediterranean in olden days, what happened during summertime was that that's when all the sea voyages took place, all the military campaigns. If you read the history books, you suddenly see everything begin to happen. It stops during winter. Travel on the Mediterranean stopped during winter. But there's an uncomfortable heat. You can labor, you can fight, you can serve, you can travel widely, but it's very uncomfortable. Every season has its problems. You know what? To stop you wanting to stay there. So even summertime, you may want to camp there, but there's certain things built in that you go, it's good, it's necessary, it's important, it fulfills its role, but I don't want it to be perpetually that. Do you see how good God is, how gracious he is, how thoughtful he is? 
In the Bible, summertime is also called harvest time. That's the name given to it. It's harvest time. You don't want it raining when you bring the harvest in. You've got to have no rain. You know the farmers are our way. I watch them every single year and I go, the very day. I, I mean, I don't know how they manage it. The farmers, when they begin to bring in the harvest, you've got to close all the windows. You can't sit outside. You don't put your washing outside. And all of that dust blows everywhere. If I'm upstairs and I've got all the windows open, everything in my study gets covered in dust. It, it's just unbelievable. But guess what? On the very morning, and this happened for 10 years now, on the very day, <coughs> Kenneth says, what a beautiful day. Let, let's spend the day outside. Yes, let's. Here comes the tractors harvesting. I don't know how they managed it. They didn't do it when it rains. Why can't they do it when it rains? Oh no, we can't do that. It's got to be the best of weather that we go out and bring the harvest in. So we see summer is ordained not to sow seed, not to break up the ground, not to plow. Summer is the time we've got to bring the harvest in. It says in Proverbs 10 and 5, He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causes shame. Is it harvest time? Is there a unique season of time where it's now ready for the harvest to come in? All the crops are ready. Why are you sleeping in bed? Why are you dilly-dallying? It's harvest time, not leisure time. I know that most people go on holiday in the summer, but not farmers. I watch farmers. I've lived next door to farmers. I watched them from a boy. I've watched hardworking farmers. I watched the time they get up, the time they go to bed, the time they stay up uh, when the lambs are lambing. They don't go to bed. They sit in a stool with that, with that sheep, with it lambing. They've got to be there. But you know what you have here? People who sleep during summer, and the heat can make you sleep, can it? Make you drowsy, make you tired, make you lethargic. Oh, how dangerous. In the Proverbs, we have the example of the ant. Proverbs 30, 25. The ants are a people and strong. Yet they prepare their meat in the summer. That's what they do. They're actually working during the summertime. They're laboring, they're preparing. And see with this summertime, I'm going to close. I'm not even going to go to the other two. I want to come back and do this in another part because I want you to understand this. I don't want to rush over this. I want to deal with this summertime and I want to close with it. Because you've got to understand, if you begin to understand what I'm saying here, it could revelate revolutionize your spiritual life. And so you see in Proverbs 30, 25, these ants are strong. Look at them, aren't they small? Have you ever watched a video on an ant that it lifts ginormous things far heavier than that? It is extremely strong. Oh, you think it's weak and spindly and can't do much. You're greatly mistaken. You could have someone with all their energy and power and strength and their lazy so-and-sos. They don't use it. You'll be held responsible for that. Yet they prepared their meat in the summer. What are the ants doing? They're preparing their food for winter time. If you prepare for winter, when winter comes, you're in serious trouble. It's a big bit like our economic crisis. If you didn't buy oil before the past two months, remember a year ago and two years ago, I was telling you, stock up in food, Stock up in oil, stock up in coal, stock up in wood. There's some people wish they would have done that now. Sure, I said that two years ago. I said that one year ago. And because of my circumstance, I neglected. I neglected. I got to August and I was panicking. Because then the newspapers are saying, we're, we're going to ban coal. We're going to do this. We're going to restrict. I watched the price of things double in a year extraordinary, the price of things. You know what? You shouldn't wait until the wrong season to prepare. What do the ants do? They prepare in summer for winter. What are they doing preparing meat? They're thinking of food. What am I going to eat during winter time? 
And so summer is a time of preparation for the future. It is a time to take in what you're going to need in the future. It says in Proverbs 6 and 8, that the ant provideth her meat in the summer and and gathereth her food in the harvest. You see, the ants, they know that harvest time is here. Bounty is here. Plenty is here. There's a reason. When you come into a season in your, time, in your life and you've got a lot of time, a lot of opportunity, a lot of provision, and yet you don't do anything with it, you go, I'll just take what I need now. You need to prepare for the future. Do you realize how much of my preaching comes out of the time I spent studying in my 20s? From 22 years old to 29 years old, You know, I had a regular schedule. It changed at times, but my regular normal schedule, I stopped work five o'clock at a nine to five job, stopped at five o'clock, about 5.30 had uh, a light tea served up to me. By six o'clock, I'm in my bedroom. I got my Strong's Concordance, my Vine's Concordance, my open Bible, and from six to 12 o'clock at night, I study the Bible and pray from six to 12 at night. And often at 12 at night, I'm walking around a dark park, praying, seeking the face of God. You know what I was doing? I was storing up for the future. I didn't reap it then. I didn't reap it during my twenties. I only began in my thirties and all of that's intensifying. I'm still drawing on what I gathered. You know, some people are called to be preachers. They're actually called Why aren't you studying? Why aren't you preparing? What do you think you'll always have a time of preparation? I knew in my 20s, I told folk, there's coming a day when I won't have time to prepare. I, I won't be able to spend six hours just studying and praying, thinking of myself every night. I won't be able to do that. I knew it was a unique, unusual time. I was a single guy with much freedom, with much liberty with many benefits, and I used it to its absolute full. It says in Mark chapter 12, verse 2, and Jesus, in one of his parables, he says, and at that season, he sent to the husbandman a servant that he might receive from the husbandman of the fruit of the vineyard. You know, summertime, the brightness, the long days, the good climate, the rain being held back, It's not a time to plow. It's not a time to sow. It's a time to labor, to bring in, bring in the harvest. There's a spiritual time in your life. You've got to go after the harvest in your family or on your street or in your city. I hope this church is ready for the right season for harvest time in Limerick. I'm preparing for that. We have not had our harvest time yet in Limerick City. We've got a harvest time all over this world. We've reached the end of the world in these two years. We've had wonderful fruit. But I'm telling you, we've been laboring all these years, praying, seeking God, sowing good seed for a harvest that's yet to come forth in this city. Don't think we've had our harvest time yet. We haven't. And people out there, wonderful people are praying for us in this church. And you know what? We need our harvest time. We have given to many others and many other nations, but we want to see a full uh, harvest in this city and in your own spiritual life. How does this summertime apply to your life? In Galatians chapter six and nine, it says, and let us not be weary in well-doing. Remember, we've just said in Galatians six, eight, about sowing to the spirit and to the flesh. Now he says in verse nine, and let us not be weary in well-doing. So doing well is sowing to the spirit. You may say, what does it mean to sow to the spirit? Well, it explains here, don't be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What summertime? It's a time to reap a harvest. Have you been praying? There will be a harvest time. Have you been sowing? There will be a harvest time. Have you been given to others? There will be a harvest time. It'll come back like a boomerang. Blessing always comes like a boomerang. So do curses. Ding. And it'll hit you either for good or bad. One way or the other. 
The Lord actually says here in Galatians 6, don't be weary, don't be tired. You see, that sowing season, you can get tired because there's no reaping. It will come. Don't, this works like a farmer. Keep sowing. But I haven't had my summertime. I haven't had my harvest. Where's summertime in my spiritual walk? Just keep sowing. Why do you think the Bible says spiritually, don't faint? Don't get tired. Waiting on a spiritual summertime Harvest time coming to your life. This is talking spiritually in your Christian life. You're waiting and summertime is delaying. Harvest time seems afar off. You've prayed, you've sought him and you're now tired. You're getting weary in your mind. You're starting to have thoughts. Has it all been in vain? You know what the Bible says? Don't grow weary. Keep doing it. Keep doing what's good. Keep sowing to the spirit. In John 4, 35, say not ye, there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are wide already to harvest. Remember when Jesus said this, this was in Samaria. This was in a city of the Samaritans. Remember, the Jews hate the Samaritans. They'll literally go around the whole region to save having to walk through Samaria. It was like a plague to say, we don't mix with Samaritans. And here the disciples, they go off for a hamburger, I mean some bread, and they went looking for a meal. And Jesus is sitting there on a well, speaking to this lady, the woman of Samaria. And they're going, what is he doing speaking to her? She's a woman, she's a Samaritan, She's had five husbands. She's now living with a man who isn't her husband. And Jesus is sitting in the middle of the day. Do you know why she's out in the middle of the day? In the heat of the day. Because all the good moral women come when it's cool. She come when it was hot. And Jesus is waiting for her at that time of day saying, give me a drink. Oh boy, I've got a drink for you today. Remember how her life was changed. And she immediately left her water pot. Immediately, she, dropped, she forgot about it. And she went to tell her people about a man who told her all things. You know what Jesus says to the disciples? While well, you're off looking for a lunch, looking for bread. And when I talk about my bread is to do the will of my father, you think I'm talking about natural food and that I'm looking for a meal. Don't you realize there's spiritual food, a meal to have? And so he tells them, lift up your eyes. Don't say harvest is four months away. Do you know the 12 disciples or apostles couldn't discern it was harvest time? They're literally in a community where revival is breaking out. They can't discern she is a vessel. They can't discern the hour. They can't see the time that they are actually in. They just cannot see it. Is this dead? Yeah, it's still. They cannot see the hour that they are in. And yet Christ is saying, don't say four months. He said, if you open your eyes, look up, you're going to see this is a harvest time. Do you realize they, if, they, if Christ hadn't have been there, they would have missed the harvest of souls within a community, within a town. Saints, don't let us miss the harvest. It's not harvest time today, but we've got to sow the seed. You've got to sow the seed way before the harvest. And you've got to keep being faithful to it. Lift up your eyes. And it says in Jeremiah, Chapter 8, verse 20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Do you realize there's an end to harvest time? There's a time when the season comes to an end. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. Summer and harvest are the same, and we are not saved. You're not saved. And you go out into a time. We go, we're going into apostasy and dearth and death and darkness and coldness. And you're not saved. You neglected harvest time, summer time. You neglected the ingathering of fish. And you're not saved. If you didn't get saved in summertime, but you think you will in winter time. You, didn't, you don't labor in summertime, but you think you'll do it in winter. You won't do it. 
You really won't do it. Saints of God, I'm stopping there, but I hope, I pray. I want you to understand this. There are four spiritual seasons in the Christian's life. They're very real, and there's a message in the Bible for each of them. And when you begin to understand God's got a purpose for each season, they look different because they're meant to be different. Different things happen. There's a different atmosphere. But it's going to produce something. Every season produces something different. And when you begin to understand the mind of God and the plan of God and the purpose of God in this, and then you begin to work with it, you work in the harvest, in the seasons, hand in hand with God. Beautiful blessing comes forth in your life. Will you pray with me here this morning? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we love you. We bless you. We thank you for the things that you have put in the word of God. We thank you, God, for the lessons, the understanding. Lord God, we can be walking through different seasons, not understanding what's happening to us, not understanding why there's no sunlight, not understanding why there's a delay, not understanding why you're pruning us, not understanding why there's no rain falling at this time. Lord God, I thank you that in these four seasons, we see the divine plan and purpose of our God, that you've set these things in order, that you've given them as a visible ex explanation of your sovereignty, of your power, of your timetable, of your dealings with us individually. And my God, we pray together right now as a church, help us to understand the season that we're in. Lord God, to work hand in hand with you. Lord God, to know when it's time to prune, when it's time to sow, when it's time to reap. Give us divine wisdom, O oh God, to see the hour that we live in. And Lord God, even to prepare for winter time ahead. If we're in summer, teach us to prepare for the winter. If we're unsaved, then Lord God, make us to get right now, to get saved in summertime, lest winter comes on and our soul is barren and dead. Lord God, will you bless your word and edify us that we might be fruitful Christians and bring forth the fruit of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord.